France has done it, Italy's done it, India's done it, and the UK too. They've all extended their lockdowns. But some countries are slowly easing restrictions. Spain, Denmark, Germany, they're all trying to go back to normal. Det bliver måske i virkeligheden lidt som at gå på line. Every nation is on a different schedule as they all tackle the same two problems. How do you slow the spread of COVID-19? And how and when do you end a lockdown? Lifting restrictions too quickly could lead to a deadly resurgence. What does the future hold? A partial reopening? A world of constant social distancing? A society dictated by so-called immunity passports? I'm going to have to make a decision, and I only hope to God that it's the right decision. In this video, we're going to find out what the options are for our future, and how this is uncharted territory with no simple answers. The COVID-19 outbreak first began in Wuhan in China in December 2019. As it spread, authorities shut down the city on January the 23rd. That lockdown came to an end on April the 8th, 76 days after it all began. While just over 2,500 deaths were officially declared in Wuhan, the lockdown ended after a reported decline in new cases. However, many have questioned the accuracy and transparency of China's official figures. Many experts believe that if countries want to stop a lockdown, they need to try to control their case numbers and have a system of tracing. You need to know where cases are happening, where people are acquiring this, even under lockdown. So that as you ease it, you can start to say, right, we're getting pockets of infection. You need to know where those are so that you can then start to really crack down on those areas again. Wuhan residents still face restrictions. People can leave the city, but they need an app that shows they're healthy and they haven't been in recent contact with anyone with the virus. And when they get to a train station or an airport, people have their temperatures checked. This all shows the need to continue to test, trace, and isolate any cases of coronavirus, even after a lockdown. Indeed, the majority of new cases in China have come from residents returning from abroad. And remember, China still has a temporary ban on all foreign visitors, even if they have visas or residence permits. People being allowed into the UK from other countries, if they come in, I don't see why we're not doing what you're doing in Korea or Hong Kong, whatever, where somebody comes in, they are told they need to stay isolated for 14 days. The key thing is this. Tackling the spread of coronavirus is not about one thing, be that a partial lockdown, social distancing or whatever. It's about a package of measures. And so if a lockdown is lifted, it needs to coincide with a raft of other preventative measures too. So you can't just end the lockdown prematurely without being ready. That's why countries are slowly easing out of their lockdowns. In Denmark, they began by allowing children aged 11 and lower to return to school. So why is that? A recent study by University College London found that school closures are likely to have had a very limited impact on the spread of COVID-19. That's because they only work when children are the big spreaders of a virus, like with influenza. And that's not the case with COVID-19. There was very little evidence that school closures were a big player in the control of COVID-19. We did recognise that when a country's back is against the wall, when you're looking down the barrel, when there's a really difficult situation, of course closing schools makes sense. But taken by themselves, school closures uh, don't appear to be particularly effective. Nations may look to open schools first, not just because it may have a small impact on the spread of the virus, but it will have other benefits too. If you close your schools, you harm the children, of course. They lose education, they lose the social support, and some children rely on schools for other services and nutrition. But you also harm your broader economy very dramatically. You take parents out of the workplace. There are huge social and economic costs when it comes to lockdowns. In the United States, more than 20 million people have made unemployment claims. And here in the UK, a report suggests the country could face its worst economic hit since the early 18th century. That's why there's so much pressure on getting the economy going again. One suggestion is that the UK could allow 20 to 30 year olds who don't live with their parents to resume their normal lives first. And that's based on the logic that um, as a statistical matter, the young are the safest among all of us. They're also the hardest hit financially. There are drawbacks. Young people can still die from this virus and this proposal could create resentment. Nick, however, stressed that a prolonged lockdown is a silent killer. People who do not have income, especially the young, who do not have any saving, the things that could happen to their mental health is unimaginable. Coronavirus, when people say, and then 
that it's, it's a great lever, leveler, but it's not really. Now, all this is completely unknown territory and it's up to governments to decide what to do. And they're all doing things differently. In Spain, they ease their lockdown by letting construction workers go back to their jobs first. A key question also is what are the rules when people do go back to work or if children start going to school again? What additional rules will you have to put into place to maximise safety in those situations? So if you take the school example, um, what rules will you put in place regarding dropping off and picking up children uh, with regard to playtimes, with regard to uh, uh, maintaining physical distance? The European Commission did come out with a blueprint for ending lockdowns, that restrictions should be relaxed gradually and should be targeted. And they say that can only begin to happen when infections decline for a sustained period, when hospitals have enough equipment, and when large-scale testing, tracing and quarantine is in place. Every action should be continuously monitored, should be continuously monitored whether the virus flares up again or the spread of the virus stays stable below a certain threshold. Now we've touched on the idea of letting some people go back to work before others. And that leads to the concept of immunity passports, where people who have had COVID-19 and are apparently immune could go back to work first. The problem is that we still don't know a huge amount about human immunity to the virus and we need more research. So right now the, the information is mixed. We need much more information from recovered patients. There's more than 300,000 people globally who have recovered um, and we really need to better understand what that antibody response is. The issue with this is also that not many people even have any of the antibodies. Because many countries have locked down early, very few people have been exposed to the virus. It may well be that very few people are going to be positive in the antibody test. I guess if it's about 10% of the population, that's not big enough to free lockdown. So we've got to look for other mechanisms. We've also touched upon apps being central to our future in order to test, trace and isolate. We saw how China was using them to monitor the virus and the concept is being looked at by the UK government with a new NHS app. If you become unwell with the symptoms of coronavirus, you can securely tell this new NHS uh, app. And the app will then send an alert anonymously to other app users that you've been in significant contact with over the past few days. Of course, critics have raised the issue of the invasion of our privacy. The UK government has said all data will be handled ethically and would only be used for NHS care and research. It's about using um, a, 20, a 21st century technology to implement age-old uh, principles of epidemiology. Yet for others, the technology alone is not helpful. You need a support network in place of medical professionals and carers to ensure people are tested, isolated and cared for. Again, this is the idea that there isn't just one answer to this question of ending a lockdown. There are multiple measures needed. Technology is can be very, very good, but it cannot stand alone. And we need to invest equally in building up that human capacity of community health workers and volunteers to do contact tracing, and local support. I think that's so important and there's very little talk about that. Ultimately, we're waiting for a vaccine for COVID-19 and that's not likely anytime soon. The vaccine, despite what we read in the papers, with all the logistics, the testing and all the rest of it, probably won't come till way after Christmas. Given that, it's likely that the way we live will have to change for the long term. And while lockdowns can be eased, some form of social distancing will have to last. One study by Harvard said that intermittent distancing may be needed in the United States until 2022. Germany is easing restrictions, for example, but said there'll be no mass gatherings until the end of August. And we still have to see how the easing of restrictions in some countries unfolds and whether it works. Und die ganze Entwicklung basiert darauf, dass wir davon ausgehen, dass wir eine Infektionszahl haben, die wir überblicken können, die wir nachverfolgen können und dass wir mehr Schutzkonzepte haben und durch die mehr Schutzkonzepte auch mehr Lockerungen machen können. Aber es ist ein dünnes Eis, wie Herr Tschentscher gesagt hat, oder eine fragile Situation oder ein, ein wirklich eine Situation, in der Vorsicht äh, das Gebot ist und nicht Übermut. Handshaking may become a thing of the past. We may have to continue to stay two meters apart from each other and so on. Some of these measures may be scaled back. But if there is an increase in cases, we could see some reintroduced. And so you could have this cycle of social distancing being turned on and off. Without a vaccine, we will be living in a world where there's always a risk when you go outside of the house. We've not had a fear like that for a long time in a country like the UK, where you really 
scared of catching something off strangers or off people you've just met. That's not to say we can't go back to anything like normality. Look at South Korea. They just had elections only a few weeks after their first cases. Perhaps mask wearing, which is so prevalent in Asia, will become the norm going forward around the world. France, the United States, Austria and the Czech Republic are all telling their citizens to wear face masks when they go out in public. However, there's still disagreement from experts on whether this works in stopping the spread of the virus. We encourage countries that are considering the use of masks for the general population to study their effectiveness so we can all learn. Masks should only ever be used as part of a comprehensive package of interventions. Masks alone cannot stop the pandemic. So there you go. That's the ins and outs of trying to end a lockdown. It's a complicated matter. And as President Trump said himself, it's a huge decision for governments to determine if, when, and how they decide to ease their restrictions. What we do know is that life will not be the same for a while, and the way we interact with each other and behave in work settings will have to change. And governments everywhere will have to be thorough in how they test, trace, and isolate new cases. The future may be safer for us all, but it's still incredibly uncertain.